ですけど。Good evening. The time is 5.30 on Monday, August 26th, and we are at our work session. And we will start tonight with a city update from Mr. Brian McCain. Thank you, ma'am. Um, first, I want to say that the uh, City of Pueblo float in the parade, State Fair Parade Saturday, took first in the civic community category. So thank you to all city employees that worked on that and helped put that together over the week and a few of us wrote it and it was a good time. Um, Pueblo Transit is providing shuttle rides to the State Fair from the City of Pueblo's Main Street parking lot to the fairgrounds. They run every 15 to 30 minutes. The shuttle and parking are free. Monday through Thursday, the first bus starts at 3 p.m. The last bus leaves the Prairie Gate at 11. Friday through Sunday, the first bus is at 11 a.m. and the last bus leaves Prairie, Prairie Gate at 1130. And then on Labor Day, the first bus will be 11 a.m. and then leaves the fair at 11 p.m. Uh, in the past week, the police department handled 3,139 calls for service. 465 of those were self-initiated calls. The impact team conducted 50 traffic stops and recovered four guns. The real-time crime center assisted patrol in identifying a suspect vehicle, vehicle involved in a shooting on South Prairie. And after a short vehicle pursuit, took two persons into custody and recovered several more firearms. And then Monday, September 2nd, is Pups in the Pools. So from 9 to 11 and then 12 to 2 at City Park Pool, $5 per dog and humans get in for free. And that concludes my update. Councilor Maestri, I just wanted to add that tonight, uh, City Council, you've received the non-departmental requests. You have one pagers inside the binder and then a jump drive with the full grant application um, attached to it. And then you'll also see a memo from my uh, non-departmental um, coordinator, Melissa, and a one pager, which will describe the requested amount request first total budget, proposed funding amount, proposed activities. We also went back uh, to 2021 to let you know the other non-departmental requests they received, if there's any CSAC approvals and any other city funding, if they got mayor, mayor or council uh, contingency. There'll be some additional notes on every single page um, that will help to better understand the funding recommendation. There are a couple entities that still had um, outstanding audits that hadn't been turned into the city that we're waiting for. And those are also listed in the notes. On September 30th, we will come and give you a full presentation. So if there's any questions between now and then, or you would like any specific non-departmentals to come to council, if you can just let us know and we'll get that requested. Great, thank you, Mayor. Anything else? Okay, um, next, uh, anything from council? Okay, um, something that I wanted to bring up um, after last week's um, council uh, work session is that work session is an opportunity for counselors to talk about anything they wanna talk about. Um, and so when I ask anything from council, that really is the appropriate time so that we could stay on task with the agenda and for new counselors coming forward, uh, coming into council this year, um, if you, anytime that you openly want to talk about um, something that you'd want to bring forward, uh, an issue that you're having or a concern that you're having uh, with anything that you're working on, uh, a concern of, on a policy, procedures, anything of that nature, this is the time to do that. And then that way, when we're working through the agenda, we can stay on task with those, um, you know, those who are presenting. Any questions or anything? So, I have a question. Okay. So as an example, me meeting with uh, constituents in my community or business owners in my community, 
would be this is the appropriate time. Well, that or at public forum, if it's something that you've met with the people in your community and you want to talk about moving, say, a policy forward, uh, it, it, some sort of ordinance forward, this is the time that you could bring it up. If you think that you'd like a work session on it, we can schedule a work session for a deeper discussion. Um, if it's something that you may want to ask, um, you know, what what's our, do we have a consensus or a agreement to like, will you get support on what you're trying to do? This is now the time to bring it up. Okay. Um, if it's a policy, um, you don't like a policy or a procedure, now's the time to bring it up because at some point we will have to discuss it in front of, in, in a meeting. And so I'm just letting you know that this is the appropriate time. Okay. So the fact that I met with uh, property owners of, of the shopping center in, in my district mm -hmm. today, mm -hmm. this is the appropriate time. If you want to bring do if you want to implement something to address their concern okay. if you just want to talk about it openly public forum is also another place okay. it's probably a little bit of both okay why don't okay. you go ahead with that okay i met with the uh, owners of the belmont shopping center today with the property manager and the owner out of denver it was a very interesting conversation um it's concerning to me because we're dealing with homeless situation there where a, a restaurant owned and that, and that particular shopping center was broken into not from the doors, but from the roof, they completely destroyed the HVA system and went in through the roof and robbed the place. Okay. Uh, in addition to that, the homeless situation is out of control up there. The, the, so we're, we're, we're going to work to, 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 to remedy that situation. But at the same time, they also are willing, they are so also are willing, the owner is to provide the city of Pebble with a police substation and that particular shopping center and to retrofit it for the police department. And I think it's gotten to the point folks in this city where we, we really need to, um, move away from the downtown area and go into the four quadrants of the city as it relates to law enforcement. But these, uh, these individuals out of Denver are extremely um, willing and wanting to enhance this community and to bring it back to where people feel safe. And on top of that, where we can bring business into this community and, and, and do those kinds of things. And this gentleman has those kind of capabilities. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Latino. Does anyone um, on council have um, any comment for Mr. Latino in regards to um, his concern for police substations at this time? Okay. All right, uh, Mr. Latino, thank you for letting us know and, and uh, just keep uh, working with us and we'll work with you as far as um, seeing if it um, if any of this is feasible, oh, thank you, know, you. We always have to look at the financial aspects, and if we right. have, can financially support that, and also man it, yeah. that you know, those are some of the concerns. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right. With that being said, um, let's go ahead and move on to our um, first guest tonight, and that's uh, Mr. Salvador Acuna and Denise with. Um, co-create and they're going to be speaking about broadband. All right, thank you. Um, welcome. And you can go ahead and start, Mr. Acuna. Thank, uh, well, first off, thanks. Thanks. Can you turn your mic on? <laughs> there we go. All righty. Well, thank you, 
Mary Graham and City Council for the opportunity to come and provide a presentation. Uh, I know it's been a while since we first started, but there's been a lot of action and a lot of activity aside from the plan. Uh, one of the unique things about the work that we've been doing is the development of the plan, but at the same time, uh, doing a, a lot of the implementation because of the dynamic environment that we're, we're involved in. So a lot of the federal funding is right around the corner. There's a, we work closely with the state for the development of the broadband plan, the broadband plan for the state of Colorado, as well as the digital equity plan for the state of Colorado. So uh, those were completed in this late spring of uh Broadband plan spring of 24 and the digital equity plan was just completed two months ago. So the focus of our presentation and of the plan is that we want to be able to provide robust, reliable, affordable internet access to every home in Pueblo for now and to the future. Uh, encourage the development of programs and resources to support broadband, digital equity, inclusion, and literacy needs for the neighborhoods to thrive. So that's the overarching purpose of the work. The areas of the plan are the following. There's a section of provides the, the background of the historically underserved community that, 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 we're, that we live in. Uh, we will talk about the Pueblo broadband ecosystem and the importance of taking an ecosystem approach to our work. Uh, the creation of the Pueblo Opportunity Project Alliance uh, which is a community coalition to address broadband and digital equity and inclusion needs. And the design of a digital marketing framework to enable the work and promote the work that is going to be done. Uh, and look at what br broadband access means, you know, for the community of Pueblo. Uh, talk about the assessment, evaluation, tracking, and reporting. Uh, the section on strategies for sustainability, there's 15 overarching strategies. And then finally, we'll talk about some of the success that we've had, you know, during the implementation in the last two years. So this is the overarching logic model. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but we decided that we would do a logic model because for most funders, uh, this is the foundational piece that they'll require. So if you look on the left, those are all the inputs from federal, state, local, and community-based organizations. We're going to design the development of Alliance, which will have a leadership team. Uh, we'll provide clarity of vision, and we'll have a network of community partners. It's going to be a coalition that's going to drive the majority of our work forward. Uh, we, we completed the... Uh, the community broadband assessment, and that's included in the plan. We'll provide some information on that. Um, and then uh, we're gonna look at public-private strategies, what they mean, uh, the options that are available, recommendations in the area of broadband access. Uh, and then we're gonna look at some of the specifics on the programmatic piece that the Alliance will be moving forward with the overarching long-term outcomes of of being the purpose that we identified. So that's the overarching logic model of, of, of the work. Next slide. Uh, we looked at an ecosystem approach, which basically is clarifying all things broadband and digital equity from the federal state level and local and community level uh, with uh, NTIA funding with the Broadband Equity Access and Deployment Fund, which is gonna be right around the corner with that funding. Uh, they really want an ecosystem approach, a community approach to be able to provide the types of solutions necessary. Uh, the digital equity funding is along the same routes. They will be able, the state funds will only be funding coalitions. So that's the reason for the design of the Alliance that would be positioned to be able to go after the funding and that funding should be available in the spring of 2025. So go ahead and next slide. This is data that we provided when we first started uh, this is data that was completed in the spring of 2022. Uh, of course, it's two years have passed. At that time, uh, we looked at uh, the NTIA had pre-designed and pre-identified uh, census tracts that were identified as underserved. Uh, there were 34 of those census tracts, 36 of the census tracts, and there was some duplication. It's 34 now uh, that were identified in uh, the city of Pueblo. 26% uh, of the residents have no internet connection at the time, 17.4 are without a computer, smartphone, computer, smartphone, or tablet. Uh, 
we call the device. Uh, the poverty level at the time was 24.4%. Uh, 79.92% of the students in District 60 were on free and reduced lunch. And at that time, there was a report that was out, Pueblo had, ranked, had been ranked 82nd in the country as far as uh, the worst connected communities in the United States. Okay, things have changed, but that at that time, that was the data. Uh, this is a, a brief little map, and it's uh, the real red areas are the underserved areas. The purple areas are uh, still classified as understood, served in this map, but not as much as the central heart of Pueblo, the Y zone. Uh, green is connectivity is pretty well. Brown is pretty well, is pretty is pretty good, but as you can see, the heart of Pueblo was at that time uh, very much not served or underserved. Uh, the components of the plan of the of, of the alliance. Uh, the model of the coalition is this uh, digital equity inclusion theory and what that means is going to drive it. Uh, we're going to have a digital literacy and devices strategy. We will look at digital navigation, a clear strategy in and around digital navigation and what that means you know, to the city of Pueblo. Uh, we're going to look at strategic granting. As part of this, we, uh, we wrote grants on behalf of the city. Uh, we, we wrote four of them. Uh, we're going to be writing um, through two here within the next couple of months. So we're going to be very active in the resource development space, looking for resources for broadband and digital equity. Uh, advocacy, the subsidies, as you know, the ACP program is no longer around. So we're looking at options for subsidies and what that could mean, you know, for those not served and some of those households that may not be able to be to be able to afford, you know, uh, services for their internet. Uh, and then Denise is going to pro provide a comprehensive overview of the broadband access strategies and what they mean to Pueblo and what it means for Pueblo to be a leader in um, Southern Colorado. Next slide. Uh, the digital navigation system, one of the things that has uh, received a lot of positive feedback in, you know, in some of the areas that we presented, we presented in, in Philadelphia and the fact that we were looking at a digital navigation strategy community-wide was very, very well received. We were asked to provide a presentation on what our activity uh, is, is in Pueblo. And the fact that we wanted to look at this strategy comprehensively is significant. Uh, other communities are looking at maybe one or two navigators, you know, where we want to be able to create a, a solution that is community-wide. Okay. A digital literacy, there's a lot of activity in this. This is kind of a snapshot of what a curriculum would look like. Uh, we've worked with numerous organizations in the city with respect to the literacy piece. Uh, we went after two proposals. The literacy piece will be uh, a central part of the proposal that we will be uh, working on, which is due the 23rd of September. Uh, that proposal will be part of the, the Alliance's work and the fiscal agent is going to be the Pueblo City County Library District uh, because they have the infrastructure to be able to really move on this. They understand how to, to manage and distribute devices. They provide literacy right now. And our strategy is to create a literacy network to bring in the partners necessary to be able to provide services, English and Spanish, work with the university, PCC, the learning source and others. So uh, next slide. The device piece right here, there was some good activity on the development of a distribution center. Uh, that is, we still have to figure that one out. So this is gonna be a, uh, a strategy that we'll need a little bit more work on. There are organizations in Denver that we can partner with, but the activity that was happening here in Pueblo is, is kind of slowed down. So this will be an area to, to look at how we can create an environment of refurbishing used devices and be able to get those in, in the hands of families and kids that uh, in many cases cannot afford a device, whether it be a, a laptop and or uh, a tablet. Okay, next. Uh, as far as the affordable connectivity plan, we wrote a proposal on behalf of the city and was funded for $300,000. Uh, but just right after it was funded, the ACP program there was the simmerings of the fact that it was not going to be continued 
and it was not continued. So the program was put on halt, but I believe that um, that once at the federal level there, be, there becomes available something to take its place, we would be ready to be able to move on this strategy. We were in this strategy, we're really looking at providing uh, connectivity to 7,000 of the 14,000 households that at that point in time qualified for the affordable connectivity plan. Next, next. Okay, Denise. Okay, so um, when we talk about granting, we talk about granting it with a specific, um, with some specific thoughts in mind. We wanna do, oop, can't take his, can I? We wanna do strategic uh, granting that um, works and brings in a lot of collaborators and partnerships that maximizes our opportunity for funding. Most uh, federal grants look for ways that you're partnering with others in your area, or um, if we're looking at a private uh, philanthropic organization, they also wanna know that you're working not in isolation. So we look to match the requirements with our partners. We align what's going on, and we, we feel that this reduces the duplication and the kind of applying over the top of somebody else in, in the area. And so we work with them so that we're all working together. And it also increases um, opportunities and incentives for uh, the funding organizations because they feel like they're gonna have a broader reach. So um, organizations in the city that we reached out to, um, uh, a group of organizations called Pueblo's Future is Better Together, and we've been working with them specifically on a number of the digital equity and inclusion opportunities that are available right now, and we hope to see that happen. Um, this is the grant that is due at the end of the month, at the end of September, and we think that, that we are positioned fairly well because we have a large coalition that has been working together, and they've all brought um, great opportunity, and they've also brought um, match. So one, one organization says, I have an extra room I can donate. One organization says, I'll help with this. And so um, there's always a match requirement, and that's funding that we're not coming asking for, because as we work together, we can do in-kind match requirements that we can reach by working together. So we think that's a real positive thing. Um, Strategic granting right now, besides the digital equity grant, um, later on this fall, the bead money will become available across the country. That's $42 billion in Colorado. That'll It translates to about $824 million for broadband development in, in the state of Colorado alone. And we will be applying for that to put an internet data exchange um, here in the city. Um, it will be the first place outside of Denver to have a connection that is close and it has better um, what's called latency. So it doesn't, it's not, there's not a, a wait time from when you push the button. Currently, if, if one of you send a, an email to the person next to you, um, it would actually travel all the way back to Denver and then back down here. That's the way the internet is designed right now. Once we get funded for the internet data exchange, that will go here to a site that CSU Pueblo has donated and then back here. We will be the first place in Colorado to have that and we will be a regional hub for the whole Southern region then. We anticipate that application to be about $14 million, $15 million in funding. It's not complete yet, so it may change a little. Um, but we think it's pretty cool. In addition to that, um, we're looking at other opportunities and we're looking for other partners. So the idea is to work together and to move forward and to bring more resources to the city. And I'm going to just go through the rest of the slides here. No, I think I'm done. Oh, the advocacy. Yeah. So um, 
these are the organizations that we've worked with at the national level to help um, share our, our story and help them understand what we want to do, get input and ideas from them. And by sharing our story with them, they share the story out and that helps us people to understand and helps us get funding. So we've worked very hard to make sure that lots of other people um, understand the the needs for Pueblo and the things that we think we're doing right. Okay, as far as the alliance structure, the structure of the alliance is pretty, excuse me, as far as the alliance structure, the structure of the alliance is gonna pretty much take on a a uh, a, a formal, natural organizational structure. Like I mentioned, the library district is gonna be the backbone. It's gonna be the fiscal agent and how we're gonna work. We will have committees that will drive the work and implement the plan from advocacy to digital navigation, to literacy, to broadband access, middle mile, the specifics of broadband. So uh, it's structured that way. Um, the that That is moving already. We are meeting Wednesday to formalize uh, parts of that. Like Denise had mentioned, this is an expansion of Pueblo's Futures Better Together uh, Navigation Committee, of which there were about nine members. Now we looked at uh, what it's going to look like. I believe there's going to be at least 22 organizations that are invited that will be a part of that at least. And so that that's happening as we speak. Uh, the marketing piece which we will be uh, a part of this. Uh, one of the key things for the adoption of the internet that's very important, especially when you're looking at working in not served and underserved communities is the fact that it's like poverty. You know, you don't, some people, if you're, you live in poverty, in many cases, sometimes you don't know that you're in poverty. You don't know what you don't have, right? And so some of these communities and these households who don't have access, right? They may have a, they may have a cell phone, but they may not have a connected dedicated connection at their home. They may not have a laptop, desktop. So consequently, you know, the fact that we need to be able to communicate and market and message the value of the internet and what it means, you know, for, for those underserved households. Uh, and this is kind of the framework of what we want to do. It's a pretty, uh, it's a, it's a strong digital marketing strategy. There's new softwares that are coming out that we're going to be integrating into it, some outstanding software. We're going to look at integrating artificial intelligence and some of the things that we're doing. So uh, the fact that we'll be moving on this will be will be significant. So we're going to, oops, got it this time. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about broadband access because that's one of the key tenants, digital equity and resources to help people once they have a connection and then broadband access, getting the connection. So there's a lot of pieces here. We wanna build on the plan that exists in, in Pueblo. The city of Pueblo does have fiber for city buildings only. And I don't think the city's really set up to subs take on subscribers and, and do that kind of stuff that providers would do. So the city fiber is used by city stuff or city things, and we keep it that way for security, among other things, okay? We also want those public-private options. We want a middle mile connection. And if you think of this like you think of the way you get water in your household, you have a bigger pipe on the outside, and as it gets smaller coming into your neighborhood and into your house, you only get, what, a half inch or quarter inch pipe. That's the same kind of thing with broadband. So middle mile is that bigger pipe like you have in a big water system. It takes that big pipe to get broadband to your home. And then last mile connectivity is from that big pipe to your home. We want competition so the pricing stays affordable for everybody and everybody wants to work hard for, for a household's um, subscriptions. And we think that Pueblo is positioned in a very nice spot to be a leadership in broadband in the communities. So we've kind of talked about some of this in a, li in a little bit more, um, the plan, how we're looking at mapping FCC, the state, and we look at research and data um, 
Here are projects that are currently underway in Pueblo right now. So Adelante Connect, which is with CSU Pueblo, the FCC project, which we have had to put on hold at the request of the FCC, the NTI Internet Data Exchange, this is the Avanzar Legacy Project. Now here's a couple that you may or may not have heard of before. Intrepid was awarded $4 million to build that middle mile around a ring around the city. So we now have that big pipe that's being constructed now. And T-Mobile, along with Intrepid, has pledged to do an $80 million build for fiber to 42,000 households. It's coming. It's in some communities now, and you're mm -hmm. seeing, um, you may have gotten a door hanger or a flyer or something. Um, it's as they build out parts of the city, they will let you know that that service is available. Um, it offers a, an option of services starting at $40 a month, which is pretty affordable. And that'll give you a fiber connection that's 300 meg up and 300 meg down. Or if you want the deluxe one, you can get two gig, which is 2000 meg of service. And that's much more money. Um, and they should speak about that, not me. So um, Comcast is doing the same thing. They have a pricing structure similar. They have a, a low pricing structure. They also have several layers and they also provide additional services besides internet access. Um, city fiber, again, that's city fiber, city funded for city use. And school district has school district fiber funded through the E-rate program at the federal level that the E-rate insists only be for school use. So those are the kinds of things that we see. Um, again, we feel that the public-private options, um, looking at, at partnerships, um, the opportunities with Intrepid, for example, offer a um, open access opportunity for other providers to come in and use the infrastructure that they've developed. And so that's a key piece for you for the future, for things to move forward. The middle mile we just talked about, last mile we talked about. And we believe that having two competitors that we just talked about, along with a number of other competitors that have been in the market, um, Hilltop, um, which used to be Rye. Highline. Highline. It used to be Rye. Um, and then um, Seacom. There are four different viable competitors in your city. And that's a good thing. You should be, you're very lucky. And so we've encouraged that and worked with all of them in different parts over the last couple of years. Um, and this talks about broadband leadership and the opportunities that will come with the internet data exchange. And um, I think you will, because of the data exchange, you'll see businesses interested in locating here because they'll have a good, robust, affordable, um, and reliable connection other than Denver. Okay. This crazy slide is uh, kind of is the strategy map. Uh, those on top, uh, there are seven specific strategies for broadband uh, and the action plans are included in, in, in your plan. Uh, there are six digital equity and inclusion strategies, uh, they're also included. And so this kind of um, kind of depicts what they're doing. One, of, one of, of the things that is really unique is that in most cases, um, broadband providers would go in and build and they would offer their services and give you a price and, and you either buy it or you don't, okay? Now that the digital equity funding is out and the fact that they realize that there needs to be more done in the underserved and not served communities. So what is happening now when we're working, we're working with other partners nationally is they're looking at a comprehensive approach for communities. 
deploying broadband, but at the same time, deploying a digital equity strategy that will enable the adoption of the internet and provide the types of learning and skill building necessary to use it. So that is a key thing. And that's what we're doing here. And actually from here, the work that we've designed here, we we're doing some work in other communities built off this comprehensive approach uh, in, in digital equity inclusion and broadband access. Next. Okay, the evaluation piece, we put a snapshot evaluation, which we built off uh, surveys, uh, focus groups and key stakeholder kind of vision, one on one sessions. Uh, we built that in because one way or another, you're gonna need to be able to evaluate what you do, right? Uh, to be able to put together an evaluation for the whole plan, it was hard to be able to clarify because it, we were working with the moving target. You know, there were the digital equity plan was happening as we were working here at the state. The broadband plan was being done and implemented. So it was just, it was kind of a, it was a crazy environment. It was really challenging, right? And so we wanted to make sure that we provided kind of a guide and a template to work with. So once those proposals came out, we can target, take what we have and make a more clearer and targeted and more robust evaluation. But we at least built in the foundation of what that could be. Okay, next. Some of the successes that we've had, I mean, it's interesting. We've, number one, we've been able to organize a network nationally. They know our, our work. They know what Pueblo's doing, you know, from Shelby to NDIA, the National Digital Inclusion Alliance. We were asked to speak at their conference, uh, the Institute for Self-Reliance. So these are really, you know, great resources that, on the cutting edge and can provide those best practices for our communities throughout the country. And so we have a direct line to their research and the work that they do and the kind of advocacy that they're able to provide. Uh, the state, we work closely with the Colorado Broadband Office since in the inception of the beginning of their planning. We work closely with the Office of the Future of Work and we're directly involved in the design of their digital equity plan. As a matter of fact, they took from our plan to build theirs. We were, we were ahead of the curve with this. And so those are some of the things that happened. As far as regional planning, you know, we worked with CSUP. We were able to get $3 million of funding for the other not the Connect project. We worked with Action 22's uh, broadband committee, helped, actually helped with the inception of that, and which is a unique environment. I mean, where you have all the providers in the Southern part of the state getting on the phone and talking about broadband to, actually weekly for a while. So it's been going on for about a year and a half now, which created a real strong advocacy group with the state to make sure that we were able to get the resources to Southern Colorado. Okay, and it happened. And so that was a key thing. Uh, and plus the work with Public Futures Better Together, significant network, as well as numerous other community-based organizations that are involved in digital equity and inclusion work. As far as uh, actual more value, okay, we have the data, all right? That was one of the, probably the best thing we did is on the front end is really get a strong understanding of the community in Pueblo and the YZO and the underserved areas. What we're doing now, this data, like I say, is two years ago. We are working with the broadband toolkit and the digital equity toolkit out of San Francisco, and we will be able to provide a granular comprehensive understanding of what the federal government has identified as covered populations for digital equity and broadband. No one else will have that. And so we would like to come back and to be able to show a before and an after, bring that data and be able to showcase that data here in the next couple of months. And we'll have to be able to use that data as far as our proposal for the digital equity competitive grant that's due on the 23rd. Um, the partnerships that we had with uh, with the Colorado Broadband Office, Future Work. Go ahead and change that. Um, yeah, it's these are some of the things you can read. We're it's just a it's been an abundance of work, but we're in a really good position uh, right now to be able to move this plan forward, uh, continue to move it forward. The forward, it's 
it's already been moving and we just want to make sure that we can continue the momentum and be able to go after the funding that's right around the corner. Next. Questions? Yeah. Yes, I am. Okay. Yes. Are you, are you complete? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good yes. Nice. Um, can you, Clyde, can you get back to the slide of uh, projects and projects um, in planning? Which one? Projects that are planned, that they are going, mm -hmm. they're in planning. Let me see if I can get there. Um, Mr. Gomez. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Sal, as you know, I've known Sal a long time. And you, I ran the SEATS program through a congressman's office. I was called Sharing Electronic Equipment District and Statewide. This program to me is so vitally critical, I can't begin to tell you. And not just because I know Sal, because I know what, if we have another COVID type incident, this is so important to have, to get out there and do it now before something like that strike again, because we'll be behind the eight ball. Um, I, I just do it simple things. I go to the library. I see people lined up when you get a chair to sit and use those computers there. And knowing that you have collaboration with the library makes me feel good. Um, the, the, the chances of being able to utilize interns in some of these issues and providing credit for them if they learn these processes. This to me is, I don't know if it should be called just a Pueblo Opportunity Project, but maybe the Pueblo Essential Project, because this is so critical. And I can't begin, I, you have my support a thousand percent. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Anyone else on council have anything to say? Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, so your, we funded you a hundred thousand dollars for you to come forward and with your consulting and so forth. Um, do you have money to get you through the rest of the year? When when do you think that you're? No. no well, actually, the, we the the funding for this project uh, ended in February. Uh, <clears throat> luckily, I don't have to connect. Was funded and implemented, so we're doing some work you know, with getting that project off the ground. Uh, we are doing work in other communities, but what we've done as, you know, number one is a contract. Number two, we're in it because we're in it. This is what we, we want to make the impact, right? And so consequently, you know, the work, uh, we had no control that the B funding was going to, they're going to change that funding date three, four times. Uh, they pushed it back pushed it about back. 18 months. 18 months. So what, what, if you remember, we came here, the funding was announced to be kind of right around the corner. They pushed it back, pushed it back, and pushed it back, and they did it with the digital equity plan. But at the same time, it allowed us to do implement some of the things that we were doing. And we, you know, lo and behold, we're in a really good position because we were able to implement the plan that we were developing. Mm -hmm. And so that was good. Going forward, you know, if we were to ask for funding, one of the key things to fund would be to fund the coordination of the alliance, right? Because it's going to be a community-wide coalition that is going to drive this work. And there's going to be significant resources for digital equity. We have a significant underserved population that really uh, have some challenges in utilizing in the, the internet. You know, we, we, get, we I don't have to talk about the poverty and some of the things that our community faces. So if you align poverty with dip, broadband access and the ability to use it, I mean, it's there's a direct correlation of, of a significant barrier there. And so we are in a good position to be able to go after that funding because we have the data, right? So if there was one thing to go forward, I would say, you know, Fund the alliance, fund a coordinator, fund a, a coordinator to be able to do this. You know, we're applications for bead and the applications for so we can get the yeah, for sure we can have the resources to get to the, the internet data exchange. Yeah, that's that's we, that'll that would be so it. your internet data exchange would be um you would have um data on all of these projects that take place. Is that and your internet data exchange is the piece um that is the second, uh, is the first place outside of Denver for all data traffic for internet access to come. Mm -hmm. And that's, um, it was originally planned for Colorado Springs. Um, we advocated quite um, 
quite hard that Pueblo was a better um, spot for it, both um, because of its distance from the front from Denver mm -hmm. and also because of its location and its leadership on the south, southern part of the state. And um, the group that works with the Internet Data Exchange Centers across the country agreed with us mm -hmm. after we laid the data out that we'd been mm -hmm. collecting. And so your broadband Aurora is Aurora is the only one that you guys brought to the table, but that's not currently active. That that's the one that was so when we talk strategic granting, mm -hmm. most of these other grants, the city isn't an eligible applicant as a lead. So we do partnerships in order to improve the opportunities for everyone involved. So for the Adelante Connect, the only organization that could apply for that was a Hispanic serving institution of higher ed. Mm -hmm. And the city partnered with and a, will have a location um, at one of its facilities and so the city is a part of that. And all of the grants that we've talked about are part and, and supportive of the city, but you don't have to be the lead applicant for each of those. As a matter of fact, you'll probably get further if you work together with uh, groups of people, which is what we found. So I noticed that Comcast is bringing their own upgrade into the community mm -hmm. and they offer services for um, underserved, um, income, you know, income qualified, reduced services and so forth. Um, I don't know about T-Mobile, but what is it that you would be doing differently than what they're doing? Cause they're providing their own infrastructure with their own funding mm -hmm. and they're providing, um, low cost services. Mm -hmm. What is it that you guys would be doing different than them? Okay. Okay. For, okay. For example, um, um, what Comcast is doing is they're doing good things. Um, what they don't do, if you, if, if you look at, uh, the hotspots and the things that they fund, uh, that's fine, but getting a hotspot is like, you know, putting a band aid on a hemorrhage. It's minimal service. We're talking about a fiber to the home solution and being able to go get money to help subsidize that solution. With the pro with the proposal that we'll be submitting on the 23rd, strategy is not done, but it's close. We're looking at subsidizing a thousand homes because there's no more subsidy now. There's no ACP program. So we're looking at doing a community navigation piece where we'll take. So who's the facilitator and the administrator of those funds? What's that? Who's the administrator? The administrator of, of that fund of those, that fund is proposal will be the city county library district. They'll be the lead applicant. They'll be the lead applicant. And they'll work in partnership with, um, I don't think we have a total okay. number, but a number of other organizations who've all come together to share their expertise and resources. Yeah. And the difference, um, both Comcast and T-Mobile have a digital equity set of offerings that they offer and they offer it and they do a good job, but they don't cover all of the different components like how do you connect to get, to get um, if you need to sign up for the SNAP program, mm -hmm. if, how do you sign up to vote? How do you sign up for... Um, all the different things that are, that are agnostic, not just to promote signing up for their program. So pretty much if you look at any service providers, digital equity components, they're looking yep. to get people to sign up for access only, but that's only a part of what you do. When we teach kids to read, if we just teach them the letters of the alphabet and they can sound out words, that doesn't mean they understand what they're reading. And so, that's the same kind of app thing we have to do with people that have never used the internet before. We have to help them understand how to get from point A to point B. So the funds that they would be receiving, 
wouldn't necessarily be to subsidize their services from, say, Comcast or T-Mobile. It would be agnostic. It, it could be either one. Oh, it can't. It yep. could be. Yep. Then we're not. And we're so not, are we even choice. set? Is our library district set up to cut checks for? Because they'd be cutting checks to those providers. They would have to subsidize if they're subsidizing yep. people. They would have to. They would somehow have to um, pay the providers mm -hmm. uh, for so to subsidize those people's services. Yeah. Are we even? Yeah, like, like for example. I mean, like that gets into like a financial. Yeah, you like yeah. for example. We don't. We don't. Yeah. The library doesn't do that now, and I don't believe they would do that. But what they do do is they allow a lending program for a laptop that is set up for that connectivity. Oh, so it wouldn't be to subsidize the cost of their services. It would be for equipment? They actually do that now. Okay. Yeah. They actually do that with hotspots, with tablets, and with And if Chrome. they do that now, aren't they getting their own grant funding for those? Um, Very things? not enough. The, yeah. the demand far outweighs yeah. what's available. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Okay, any other questions from council? Yes, council. I uh, want just simply looking at this for me in reference to program development. And I look at, you know, people say, well, maybe, you know, folks, everybody has a cell phone. But if you ever realized working on a cell phone as opposed to working to a tablet, as opposed to working to a minimum of 11 inch screen, it's just incredibly so much more progressive if you get away from a cell phone, first of all. And not everybody has a cell phone. But for me, this program is so essential. It, it really is. And if we're going to achieve the digital equity and inclusion that you're talking about, I wish this would have been done a long time ago. And maybe we can set the model for the rest of the country. Is that possibility if we do this right? Yep. Okay. There's a couple that are ahead of us, but we could beat them. Yeah. It's exciting. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Councillor Maestri, I have a couple. Okay. Councillor Martinez? Yeah, thanks. I, you know, to your point, Councillor Maestri, I guess I'm confused as well, because if I remember correctly, a couple of years when we ago, when we approved the contract, I thought it was for co-create to write grants as the subject matter experts on behalf of the city so that the city is the fiscal agent so that the city does receive the funds. And I, I guess I'm confused to hear that that's not necessarily the case anymore. Yeah, no, the 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 the, uh, the contract was to uh, write three to four proposals. I believe it was four. We did that, and the strategic granting approach uh, is, uh, with respect to moving forward in that way, you need to write for the proposals that best fits the right fiscal agent. The city, in some cases, is just not the right fiscal agent. For example, we're looking at a, if you look at, at the internet exchange point, the, the, the lead on that, in most cases, needed to be a IX, it had to be an, an internet service provider, right? But you need to have a public-private partnership to make it work, right? So we had the city, we had the, the, the internet service provider, we brought Connected Nation in, who brought in the IXP, and we had CSU Pueblo and the CSU system to donate the land to house the Internet Exchange Point at CSU Pueblo, right? That was not, we can't say we want, you got to come to the city and do it. They specifically wanted to be housed at a higher, at an institution of higher learning because of the amount of traffic that universities have and they want it because it's about learning right whether it's business learning community-based learning or formal institutional learning and that was the request of that entity so that's where you needed to go i mean on behalf of the city yeah we would be fine but at the same time the funding that we're looking at really it didn't work it worked for this for the for for for, for the Puebla water project for the the $300,000, yes, it did work there. And we did get funded, but the ACP program um, is no more. Mm -hmm. So it's like, well, you know, you got to do it. Our approach was to be able to do 
these number of proposals that would impact the community, right? So what does that mean? It means to impact the community. And that's what we did. And what were the four, pro you just said that you wrote four proposals under the ARPA contract. What were those four grants that you wrote? Yeah, um, we wrote the proposal with um, for connected minority communities with uh, the city, with CSU Pueblo. Um, we wrote the uh, proposal for uh, digital navigators to sign people up for broadband access with FCC. And the um, lead on that was the city. We did write in a proposal or we prepared all of the work for the Colorado State Digital Equity Part 1 for AmeriCorps. Uh, and that was the city as the lead applicant. And that was not able to be completed. Um, the city uh, wasn't able to, to complete that application. Then we wrote a second uh, Colorado State Digital Equity AmeriCorps application with the second round of funding, and that we moved the fiscal agent to um, the Pueblo Library District. Uh, that was not funded. All the applications for the AmeriCorps funding um, stayed in the Denver, and so there were no there were no applications funded in any other part of the state. We did apply for capital project funds um, for the internet data exchange. Um, that was not funded under capital projects. The Colorado Broadband Office has asked us to resubmit under the BEAD program. Um, we, so, oh, and um, while we weren't a part of it to any extent at all, um, Intrepid, did write a middle mile grant for $4 million to build the ring around the city. So um, there are six different grants that have been um, in process. Um, and there are three more that we see happening over the next year or so. One of, one of the key things even probably even more important than this, for example, a uh, year and a half ago when the state uh, began to categorize regions in the city as opposed to tier one, tier two, or tier three. Tier one being the most underserved and you would be able to, you would only have to pay a 25% match if you're a tier one community, right? Tier two, 50% match. Tier three, you're done. Okay. So, all right. So when that happened, we Pueblo came out as a tier two community with our data, all right? So we work with the Action 22 Broadband committee and all the providers. And we said, no, 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 ain't gonna happen. We went to the director of the Colorado Broadband Office and said, no, we showed them all the data advocated. We were changed because of that from a tier two to a tier one community, which was significant. Now we only have 25% match for all the broadband infrastructure funding that we go forward with, right? So there's much more to it than, you know, sit back and 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 doing writing the grants. We did that. We know that's part of it. But the strategic approach to what we did is what we needed to do to be able to bring the value that we needed to Pueblo. Okay. All so right. well, we're gonna have to move on okay. this evening because we have another guest um and they have um the net the last part of the meeting. Um if any counselor thinks that we need to discuss this any further, we can always uh mm -hmm. ask to have you back. Just one quick note, I think I mentioned of it, we'd like to come back to be able to showcase the new data, which I think is really, uh, really important for, for council and the mayor and all of you to, to see what what the cutting edge data shows. And we could be able to right. do that. Okay, okay. thank Great. you. Thank you so much. Bye -bye. Okay, next we have um, Conflict uh, Free Case Management Services with uh, Ms. Stephanie Garcia and Colleen Batchelder and Nancy V. Hill. From the, um, Stephanie's with the ARC and Colleen and Nancy are with the Resource Exchange. Welcome, ladies. Thank you. Hello.
思いましてね。悩んでいます。ああ、そうなんです。So let us know how the PowerPoint works. Who controls that? We do. Okay. Can I get a five second IT assist right there? That button there. Okay. So good evening. I'm Stephanie Garcia. I'm the executive director、uh, with the ARC here in Pueblo. And I'm Colleen Batchelor. I'm the CEO with the Resource Exchange. And I'm I'm Nancy Vihal. I'm the Director of Navigation and Quality at the Resource Exchange. So, the Resource Exchange is a nonprofit that serves individuals of all ages with disabilities, many of whom require long term supports and services across their lifespan.、Um, we are an organization that was created 60 years ago by families when Colorado was moving its system of services for people with disabilities, particularly people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. From institutions into their home communities, really hoping to establish、um, community placements for these people.、Um, and so we were set up as a, a community centered board、uh, in 1964. Um, to support those community services for ind individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Then in 2019, we also assumed responsibility for what's called single entry point services, which broadened it for people with a variety of other disabilities beyond intellectual and developmental disabilities. And then in this past year, we have been named now the case management agency in Colorado's complex system.、Um, and we're no longer just a, a community centered board or a single entry point agency, but we're now the case management agency. And we support、um, Pueblo County, El Paso County, Teller County, and Park County.、Um, and we're supporting about、uh, 13,000 individuals across those counties、um, with a variety of, of disabilities. Actually, the resource exchange came to Pueblo probably about eight years ago when I approached them to、um, consider offering case management services in Pueblo along with Colorado Blue Sky at that time. And over those eight years, approximately 40% of the people that were enrolled in developmental disability waivers moved towards the resource exchange. So they're certainly not new to our community. So,、um, the ARC is a local chapter of the ARC of the United States. We were established in 1957 in Pueblo. We became part of,、uh, we, the families kind of dovetailed on the civil rights movements at the time because really the only choices families were giving for their children were institutions. And so the ARC became a movement in trying to develop community based service systems for their children. Passing laws to allow children to go to public schools.、Um, we are the net one of the la,、uh, largest、um, organizations in the country that serves people with developmental disabilities. And some of the specific services that we do、um, include what we call community assists,、um, which are just basically people calling and they need to get connected and they're not quite sure who to call, where to go to. Um, so, we do a lot of、uh, help with vocational rehab.、Um, it could be、um, housing issues. It could be getting into waiver services, getting financial eligibility, things that we would then pass on to the resource exchange. We do a, a lot of special education advocacy in our schools. We attended over 300、um, individual staffings last year for students on IEPs and what's called a 504 plan, making sure that they're getting the necessary services and supports they need in the schools. The ARC of Pueblo also has a large guardianship program that was started in the 70s when people were coming out of the institutions and no had no longer had involved family. Um, and so right now we have,、uh, we serve as legal guardians for 74、uh, adults with、uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities that、um, don't have family members that can provide that service or appropriate family members to provide that service. We get a lot of referrals from adult protection,、um, the police department.、Um, so we, we, 
we get a lot of referrals from several agencies. And we do public policy advocacy as well, making sure that laws and, and local policies at the local state uh, and national level with the ARC of the United States, um, we're passing policies that support people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Try to speak into this microphone. I'm gonna move up a little bit. Um, so when Stephanie talks about services, long-term care services and supports that uh, we provide, they're home and community-based services. Um, we and as Colleen said, we we serve birth to death. So we have children's waivers. There's four of them in the state of Colorado. Um, we have the children's extensive support waiver the children's life limiting illness waiver. We have um, the children's home and community based waiver. And we also have um, the children's HCBS waiver. And so each of those waivers have different targeting criteria, certain level of care assessments. But once a child qualifies, we help find services and supports so that they can stay in their the family home. Um, we also have and administer six adult waivers throughout the state of Colorado. Some of those are non-IDD waivers. So uh, what we refer to as a uh, single entry point waivers. Um, and those waivers are really designed to help people with other disabilities like we have, it's called the Elderly, Blind, and Disabled Waiver. That waiver is specific to keep um, our, our elderly population in their homes without having to go to a nursing facility. Um, and we also have um, developmental disability waivers. So those waivers, um, additional targeting criteria, but the end goal for each and every waiver is to keep those individuals in their home. We, we use this slide as an example of how confusing this system can be for families. And so the resource exchange, as well as the ARC of Pueblo, when we get those initial calls, it's a lot of handholding to walk people through these various systems to see um, what they do qualify for. And the whole intent about the go into no wrong door is instead of being turned away for all of the various, it, no, you need to go here, you need to go here, you can walk into the resource exchange and they can connect you with any waiver that you do, that you are qualified for. So prior to Colorado's case management redesign efforts, um, there were two organizations providing the community-centered board and single entry point services in Pueblo. Um, Colorado Blue Sky was providing those services, those case management services, as well as direct services for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And the Pueblo County Department of Human Service was doing um, that case management support, support for people um, accessing the single entry point services. So all of those other disabilities and services. Case management redesign, as Stephanie was saying, was really focused on integrating those so a, a, a person and their family could come in one door and figure out which one of those waivers might be the best to meet their needs, and they consolidated those then as a case management agency. So they were trying to create a no wrong door, but what they were also doing was working to comply with the federal um, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid's requirement that the person or organization providing case management services does not also deliver the actual services to the person because there is believed to be a potential for a conflict of interest that you would be deciding on which services and then delivering those services which you get paid to do um, and so they wanted um, that to be separated um, the resource exchange was the only case management agency in the state that has never provided those direct services. We've always only been a case management agency. Therefore, we didn't have that conflict of interest issue for us. Colorado Blue Sky had to make its decision and did decide to go to deliver those direct services and not deliver the case management services. And Conflict-free case management is something that advocacy organizations have been um, pushing for 
Uh, we've had the same system for 50 years, um, the community center board system. And most community center boards, uh, with the exception of El Paso County, did both, as Colleen said. But it was through the help of the federal government passing laws that removed that demanded states go to conflict free. We were finally able to get that to happen in Colorado. So fast forward to today, um, we're we're talking about the perfect storm, or maybe you can refer to it as the imperfect storm, because all these things converged at once, which caused a dis a total disruption to the services to services statewide. You probably all heard about that, but we've we have we're working in a depleted workforce. Uh, most of our care workers or uh, personal care workers, um, they're paid very little or minimum wage. And it's very hard to employ someone to care for your um, your elder parent or your sick child with, with minimum wage. Um, and really to make sure that they get the the advanced care that they need. These are long-term services and supports, meaning this person or individual who qualifies needs lifelong support. Really, that's what it, it equates to. So we have a depleted workforce. Um, we had what the public health emergency, the COVID. And so during COVID, um, the state of Colorado decided that anyone who was on Medicaid would be forced past, meaning they wouldn't have to submit financial verifications. They wouldn't have to fill out applications. They wouldn't have to jump through those loopholes anymore. So fast forward to today, they unwound that. And meaning people had to reapply, resubmit financial verifications in order to qualify. Well, people, the public got used to not doing that anymore. And so they were essentially ignoring any notices they got because, you know, it's 2024 and, you know, you don't know who's legitimate, who's not. And when you're asking for uh, financial documents and they can't be redacted and we need your bear, we need your trust information. A lot of people were very resistive to that, which caused even a bigger disruption to services because now they don't qualify anymore for Medicaid or for long-term care Medicaid. Um, the case management redesign, everyone had to uh, separate, decide wh which, do you want to be a case manager? Do you want to be a provider? Well, that caused restructure throughout the state of Colorado. And so it was really assuming other entities and really learning the system. If you were a SEP provider or a single entry point provider, you didn't necessarily know the community or the CCB site or vice versa. So these case management agencies had to learn both sides of the world at once. We were fortunate enough that we assumed uh, really being a case management agency back in 2019. So we know we knew both worlds the CCB world and the SEP world. Um, there was that. And then it caused delays in enrollments because to in order to qualify for long-term care Medi Medicaid, it is, it is a really long process. And the resource exchange individuals through that because the system is so complex. If I were to give any of you a Medicaid application and tell you here, fill it out, and this is what you got to submit, um, you, you would be confused. Like it causes us confusion and we do it every single day of our lives, pretty much so. Um, then came the new care and case management system. That's a statewide system that was implemented with um, many bugs. Um, we're trying to work through those, but essentially what that causes is for our providers not to get paid. 
And if we can't create what's called a PAR, um, nobody gets paid, including the resource exchange. But what that really equates to is the members who desperately need these services have to go without because their providers aren't getting paid. Um, This then also caused a significant workload for all of the case management agencies. What used to take us maybe two hours to do, we're lucky if we can get one service plan to go through in a day. It, it's very complex. Then it's causing stress, burnout. Um, our members are very, uh, rightfully so, they're scared to death because this is their lifeline. A lot of our um, waiver recipients, for example, in the elderly, blind, and dis disabled waiver, they really need that support. They need a personal care worker to come in and help them bathe, dress, maybe clean their house, do laundry, um, transportation. We have non-medical transportation or non-emergency medical transportation. Well, now it's very difficult because if the provider doesn't get paid, then they won't take them to the grocery store to go get groceries or to go get their prescriptions or, you know, and it's like the imperfect storm, everything coming together at once. And really it's, it's impacting our members the most. So as she said, this was happening statewide. And so people were getting kicked off Medicaid and not really even knowing that until they went and got a prescription filled. And we're being told by the pharmacy, you're not on Medicaid anymore. And so the 15 chapters of the ARC, ARCs in Colorado, along with the community center boards and case management systems, we did ask healthcare policy and finance and the governor's office to suspend all terminations and go back to the COVID, um, just let people you know, let's let's slow this train down. Let's get people their services back, and they agreed to do that. Um, so we're we were bombarded. They were bombarded with families coming in asking for help with the applications. We were hand carrying them in because they were getting lost on the state's website. Um, it it's a real mess. So, um, but hopefully we're meeting weekly with the state along with the case management agencies and slowly trying to get all the bugs out of the new software system. Really quite positive given what you just heard. Um, we um, are making great strides in our staffing. Um, we still have vacant positions, but we have made great advancements in that area. We are also in the middle of hiring a large number of temporary staff to help with all of the backlog of activities that have been created through all of these system challenges. Um, and we have uh, sought and been awarded almost a million dollars in ARPA funds to help with building new systems that are automated that members and their family members can access and see where they are in the process. Providers can get in, see in real time when their authorizations for billing happen. Um, and so we see a brighter future, but we are working through a great deal of struggles um, as we are working through these system challenges. Any questions? Any questions? Uh, Councillor Flores. You know, you deal with uh, the most vulnerable uh, individuals, and, and I know you also deal with infants, so you're dealing with infants all the way until death, really. And uh, there, you know, as a city council, uh, those individuals are, they're our constituents. We represent them too. Uh, is there anything uh, that a city government like the city of Pueblo could do, you know, uh, or do more uh, to help these individuals or to help the agencies like yourselves um, in, in some fashion? I, I don't know what that is, but is there anything, um, and I know you guys do a good job. I mean, you, you're the professionals in that area and these individuals are so vulnerable that uh, somebody watching out for their interests and also looking at uh, their environment and everything that goes with that. Um, you know, you're, you're doing God's work, I think. And well, my we question then goes back to whether or not a city government, uh, whether 
Is there something that we can do? Is there something that we create that gets in your way uh, that might cause more bureaucracy? I can speak to the relationships that you have with nonprofits in Pueblo, um, particularly around the unhoused. Um, we had an intake last week of a young man that we became guardian for that was living in deplorable conditions. Um, APS stepped in, we agreed to become successor guardian. We have him in a staffed home now. We bought him beds, bedding, clothing. He's within a two week time period, he's thriving. Um, and, and so there are so many individuals that have a mental health diagnosis, that have a developmental disability that would qualify for these waiver services. And so as the city continues to work, and I'm hopeful that the school district will come and meet with you, um, a lot of our special education staffings are with unhoused families um, that need extra assistance because they don't have a car. They can't get, if it's a site-based program on the other side of town, they can't get their child there. And so we need to go in and ask for related services around transportation for that child to get the needed special education services that they are entitled to. And, and so, you know, I'm, I know how much work that you do with nonprofits and it's money well invested. Uh, we collaborate with a lot of other agencies, uh, both the Resource Exchange and the Arca Pueblo, but I think that's one of the most important things that you do is that collaboration. Thank you. Hi, Councillor Gomez. Yeah, as the father of a special needs, uh, he's 42 years old, why am I getting old? Um, We've utilized a lot of the services. I sat on the Public Diversified Board. It launched me into a career in mental health work, um, a second tech for a long time. So I'm very familiar with this. So so far tonight, two of two for two. Um, but I'm concerned about things like that people don't understand about the system. Have you ever had issues where something as simple as a code can be confused? And if you do send that for payment that you could end up in an awful lot of trouble at the federal government level? Has that ever occurred? Has that ever happened to you guys? Because when you try to do codes, CPT codes in particular, and you submit it and you submit it wrong, we've had cases where fines of $200,000 were not unusual. Have you ever run into any of that? The worst situation I ever had was in 1995 and you were a real champion when you were with Scott McGinnis's office. And it was a mess because it was overbilling for a million dollars that was overspent. Boy, was wow. And you were able to help with getting the attorney general involved and people did not lose their services. Um, we were able to get I have a witness. Result. I'm not full of crap. I'm yeah. telling you. Yeah. I, I've been around these areas and he's and I think Dennis hit right on right on the head. You guys are doing God's work, and thank you guys so much. Thank and you. my baby's body too, as well. <laughs> uh, Councilor Latino. Yes, uh, you talked about the IEP, Individual Education Program. My my concern are young people. Okay. Um, obviously that's my background. Individual education program. Tell me how you engage with the schools, in particular the public and or the private schools, as relates to the young people that are IEP based. So that would be us. Um, we get a call from the parent or the guardian that there's a problem. We also get calls from the schools that there's a problem and they want to engage an advocate to come in. My staff are trained as facilitators. They go in and try to find common ground. We do an intake with the family. We bring them in. We look at their current IEP. Or in a lot of situations, they've been asking for testing for an IEP and have been turned away. And so we help them put it in writing. We give the school district 45-day notice. You have to get this testing done. We need a meeting and... Then we look at the testing results. Sometimes we have to get an outside evaluation done if we want to challenge the district's about evaluation. So it's a whole process of just getting somebody in um, with the baby zero through three. It's an IFFSP, a family support plan. And then they transition into part B of what's called the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. And then there are certain rights that a student has with that qualify for those protections. So so let's talk about the schools because I understand basically 
having done this myself and having a background in that, that, that the social worker, the psychologist, the special needs teacher, whoever it might be, and the parents are all involved. So you're working with them as well? It's, they're all part of the interdisciplinary team, yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Is that all for this evening? Thanks again for asking us to come. Yes, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. We appreciate it. I, I have been hearing this throughout the community of people services being cut off, and now it's I, thanks for bringing it to my attention as to why. I appreciate it. Okay, thank you, ladies. And um, I guess we will be adjourning until 7.05. And when we'll start our regular council meeting. Meeting is adjourned at 6.55. Yes. 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 Yes.